this is the stepping off point from where this industry may or may not succeed for them. Their job is to spin something that's so toxic and, and they have to keep spinning it until the public goes, oh, sounds like a good idea. I am absolutely certain that fracking can be stopped in the UK and it will be stopped. I think it made clear that we were serious. I think they thought we were playing before. It's about power and about the culture that is wrapped up with power. This is the one where they're trying to start, and this is the one where we really want to try and stop them. The main goal was always to disrupt Quadrilla as much as possible. When first tried in Lancashire in 2011, the gas extraction process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking produced 58 earthquakes. Exploration digging for shale gas has been suspended. It was the fracking that caused these mini earth tremors, these uh, earthquakes. After an earthquake was felt earth. nearby. Six years later, the same company applied to try fracking again near Blackpool. Hi, my name is Mark Miller. I'm the CEO of Quadrilla Resources. And we're standing today in front of a drill rig that's drilling a new exploration well to 9,000 feet near Blackpool. Lancashire County Council received 25,000 written objections from residents against Quadrilla's plans to extract gas by fracking. A long-standing councillor rang me one day and said, would you like to go to a fracking meeting? And I'd never heard of it. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I just said, yeah, OK, I'll come along. Round here, people can't sell the houses. We haven't even got fracking yet. People do not want to come and buy property in Rosica. We've had examples of that already. People in this village, or these two villages, can't sell the properties because people don't want to live near a fracking site. Effectively, our properties around here are worthless. After about three years where I went to a meeting held by an action group against fracking and then a meeting held by Quadrilla, and that's when I decided that for the good of filed, I felt that fracking was a really bad thing. Quadrilla's first planned site to be fracked is on a dairy farm on Preston New Road near Blackpool. But why is fracking so controversial? Fracking is complicated. Oil and gas companies drill into the ground they take good water, mix it up with not so good stuff, and shoot it into the wells to force out the gas. Wastewater gushes up and gets stored for eventual disposal. All should be good, until trouble finds a way in. A tear finds a way into the lining of a waste pit. Poisonous vapors find a way into your lungs, and cancer-causing chemicals find a way into your glass. Not good at all. In Swansea, protesters occupied the Energy Safety Research Institute. Quadrilla's former chairman, Lord Brown, was behind the creation of the institute. There have been a lot of talk that the fracturing process can affect groundwater. Well, what you have to realise is where those little fractures are occurring is about one mile away from where the groundwater is. So, and the fractures themselves are at most about 100 feet long. So clearly that's not going to cause an effect. But it has been shown, and it is a risk, and it's something that industry does need to understand, that not the fracture process, but because you've drilled uh, a hole, you've put metal piping down, and what they do is pump concrete, uh, cement down, and back up again. So they sort of cement the pipe in place. 
if that's not done correctly, there is always a chance that the gas can leak on the, instead of coming up the inside of the pipe, will come up the outside of the pipe through that concrete, and then there is a chance that it will diffuse into the groundwater. The method of gas drilling they use is called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. It blasts a mix of water and chemicals 8,000 feet into the ground. The fracking itself is like a mini earthquake. Many heard of fracking for the first time from the movie Gasland, released in 2010. What people outside don't know is how big these lorries are that come down, 10 at a time, bumper to bumper. It's not a little bit of traffic that's going to hold you up for five minutes, but all these huge lorries are full of poisons. You will find out soon what you've done. Go on, support the frackers. It's a popular fracking. issue with people that, oh, these chemicals are Bring toxic. To but what goes down isn't the problem. What comes back up is actually far more of an issue because the water that comes up has hydrocarbon in it. Uh, even if it's a gas well, it has organics in it. It has bacteria. It has a radioactive material, what's called norm, normally occurring radioactive material. Um, it has different salts in it and metals in it. And so that water is actually far more hazardous than what went down. And that's something people haven't really thought about. Everyone's fixated on, oh, these chemicals are being used. The fact that you stand on the other side of the road and watch wagging after wagging after wagging going in, and how angry that makes you feel, actually, and how useless. And the fact that you stood there with your residents we're saying this is frightening, look at that, that's happening a few hundred yards from my home. Most of the impact is not at the drilling site, it's off site, it's the road collisions, it's the air pollution, it's the traffic, it's the noise. All the frac sand which they inject down the hole has to be dug up somewhere. And in Britain, if you're in Bedfordshire, if you're in North Buckinghamshire, you're on frac sand. So there's a whole lot of other impacts. And my background is in engineering and I like to look at systems. And so when I look at a system, the hole is just one part of that. And when you look at how all these other relationships, what you find is it, this is going to be national. It's not going to be just a few places in Lancashire or Yorkshire. The whole country will be impacted by this, either through greater traffic generation, waste disposal, effluent being trucked around and falling over, falling off the road and spilling. This is a big national issue. Quadrilla tried fracking for oil in East Sussex in 2013, but abandoned, claiming it was uneconomical. During the daily protests in Balcombe, Member for Parliament and leader of the Green Party, Caroline Lucas, was arrested while protesting. The protests at Balcombe did really help put fracking on the political agenda and I think it did begin to change people's views about it because they began to hear another side, not all of the government myths about the fact that fracking was supposed to make our fuel bills cheaper. Absolutely no uh, evidence to base that on at all to the contrary. Fracking is going to make our fuel bills more expensive and it's certainly going to pollute our environment and compromise the climate. Fracking is not just about the environmental issues, it's not just about climate change, it's actually about much wider issues to do with neoliberalism. So what we wanted to do was to bring together a group of people, a group of uh, organisations that reflected that. So uh, as a result, I gave an interview on BBC Radio 4 Today programme and then the next thing I know is um, that I'm being met by the Telegraph and being chased by a Daily Mail photographer. And, uh, and then you have all these articles going, you know, mob leader, protest leader and all this stuff. They picked up on my name um, and uh, Kelsey Fry, Jamie Kelsey Fry, and I have a brother who's a famous QC. And uh, so the, what's called profiling is a process whereby the state or the corporate state, whatever you want to call it, they like to try and uh, take the power out of an activist movement or a protest movement by singling out individuals. 
and saying privileged people and it's all about middle class people just playing around and Tarquin will eventually be working for daddy's accountancy firm, you know, and that's, that's a principle, that's, that, that's a process that they've used loads in the past. One of the things that's very striking about fracking and similar activities is how irrational it is. Often it's a far more expensive way of generating energy than some of the low carbon alternatives. Often it's far more disruptive. It requires a great deal more political persuasion and a great deal more policing to allow it to happen. You could do it all so much more easily. So why do they do it? And it's not just an economic thing. It's about power and about the culture that is wrapped up with power. And a lot of that power culture is about extraction. It's not real business. It's not proper male economic activity unless we're ripping open the earth and tearing her bowels out. Then we know we're doing something right. Then we know we're doing real business. That's real business. All that namby-pamby wind farms and solar and stuff. Ah, that's, that's not what real men like us do. And you know, when the politician puts on their hard hat and puts on their yellow jacket, then they know that they're talking to real men and doing a real man's activity and they look tough and they look like a real man themselves because these people are deeply insecure. One British energy company is using its resources, including producing this advert, to campaign against the fracking industry. Working for electricity is a bit like working for a campaigning organisation, but we are commercial. Ecotricity is actually now joining the campaign with you. <laughs> we are a commercial company, but we are next month launching the People Power Fund, which is actually, if people join Ecotricity, we will donate £50 to our People Power Fund purely for anti-fracking groups to draw our money. The Sun newspaper attacked the Ecotricity founder for supporting the anti-fracking protests. That's one of those kind of cheap arguments, isn't it? You're only doing this for the money is what they're saying. But, you know, that's a nonsense if you look at, uh, you look at the things we do as a company. You know, we, we put our time and our money into the things that we believe in. Green electricity was the first thing. Um, green gas came later. Uh, electric cars, actually, just before green gas. We built a car, we built a network to charge electric cars. You know, we're trying to drive this revolution in sustainable living. One journalist created her own platform to report on the issues around fracking. I set up a website to report on the onshore oil and gas industry following the Balkan protests. And my intention really was just to record things that people said to me. Um, there was a lot of useful material coming out of those protests from pro journalists and I just felt it should be that that story should be chronicled. The mainstream media has not reported uh, on fracking in a totally honest way, mainly because it's not centred in London and it's where the media is. I set it up to do consistent, independent journalism. So I made a decision right at the very beginning, no advertising, no funding from either side, no funding from regulators and no sponsorship, which um, has, had, has freed me from any kind of constraints over what I might write about. So I write about what interests me and what I think will interest the reader. Activists are using social media to distribute their own version of events. Activists and grassroots groups report every single bit of fracking and it's wonderful. It's really good to see. Uh, it's, we know where it's coming from. Um, they are investigating, they are uncovering stuff, they are doing the job of journalists, frankly. Um, and you know, good luck to them. They're not talking to the uh, to the fracking companies. Um, uh, they don't see any needs to. Their agenda is to raise awareness and um, start the protests, which are happening already. I think they're very effective. Very, very effective indeed. 
if I'm on my um, camera or on my laptop, I can be filming something and rather than just capturing the video, it will be at very live time in that moment, broadcasting to everyone who's looking at it on Facebook or Bamboozer or whatever you do it on. As with many walks of life, social media is playing a really crucial part in protests today. Um, the usual Facebook, Twitters, Instagrams are all being used here, um, which plugs you straight into your mo more immediate audience of people who are interested in fracking typically. So it's really good for getting the message out to people who are already interested in. A video footage that you choose to upload or not later is one thing, but live streaming, you kind of lose control because it's immediately out on the internet. So personally, I'm, I'm cautious of overusing live stream too much, but there's different debates within the movement as to how, how good an idea it is. To me, I work in a non-violent, peaceful movement and I'm really proud of everything we do. And I can't think of anything I wouldn't live stream. You know, it's, it's a proud and happy thing to do. And it gives you the opportunity to create a narrative without speaking directly to the police. So I can walk along a police line and say things like, you know, it's very sad that you know, these men will go home and maybe their children say, what did you do at work today, Daddy? You know, what's he gonna say? I dragged an old lady across the street and I got a truck through. You know, where was the pride? and the honour in that job. You know, these people probably signed up to be community officers because they gave a damn about community. And now they're no more than, you know, truck runners and security guards. Now you can't say that looking to someone's face, but you can talk a narrative over them and hope that that impacts them. I'm going to sign off now and I'll check back for comments later. In general, there is an arrogance um, of the oil and gas industry, and that's been prevalent for years. So I think there's a dual function. One is how we're presented information, but also, as you call it, the arrogance of industry that isn't willing to be more open and explain, you know, to adults, you know, what's being done, what it involves, how, you know, what are, what is the processes, and we all of us fear things we don't understand. Quadrilla have also turned to the internet to persuade shareholders and the public about fracking. Welcome to Preston New Road, the site of Quadrilla's shale gas exploration site here in the heart of the Lancashire countryside, not far from Blackpool as you can see. This is a unique site in the United Kingdom because for the first time there's going to be drilling horizontally into the shale rock. Quadrilla, a Lancashire-based company specialising in the search for the hydrocarbons we need to keep our homes warm and industry going. The mainstream agenda doesn't really have much patience with something that will stick with road protests for a while and then it has to move on to fracking or climate change or, or whatever. So as long as you've got environment correspondence, you will have coverage because that's what they do. Uh, but uh, at the moment, there, are, there, there would appear to be much greater political and social things happening which are shoving those off, the environmental issues, off the mainstream agenda. The mainstream media descended on Balkan. It was like some kind of amazing media festival, really. Um, it was relatively close to London. It was um, the Tory heartlands. Suddenly, there were 50-year-old women who voted Conservative and read the Daily Telegraph um, marching in the road and coming face to face with police officers and an oil company. You flatter me. You really flatter me. That's just so flattering. For the mainstream media, it was a brilliant story, and they stuck with it, fair dues. But then when it ended, the, the, the circus moved on, and there wasn't really any more coverage. Um, so I then thought, well, this is a story that's not gone away, but the attention has gone away, so it's important that somebody else keeps this going. And that was really the reason why I carried on doing it, and because I found it incredibly interesting. I think the earthquakes alerted me in the first place that something was going on. So, and then somebody mentioned this word fracking. <laughs> I saw a couple of posts online, so I thought I'd have a read about it. And then I was just horrified that they were even contemplating bringing this here or, or anywhere, really. Um, also coincided, I'd just become a grandmother. And I think that kind of opens your eyes to the, you know, the, the future generations and what, what we are actually leaving them behind. It makes you look more long term. Here, we moved here and we were told when we moved here, we're not even allowed to have 
UVPC windows. We're not allowed to put satellite dishes up because it's a rural area and everything has to be kept in keeping with living in a rural area. And, you know, you respect that because that is why we moved here, to keep, you know, for, for that way of life. And yet Quadrilla can come along and propose to put, like, a 50-odd metre rig and ten, two 10-by-metre ten flaring stacks and a workover rig and sand silos and water tanks and diesel generators and fracking pumps and six axle HGVs coming in and out. How the hell is that in keeping with a rural area? I think if you go back six years, very few people knew what fracking actually was and what Quadrilla wanted to do to Fylde, which at, at the end of the day, they want to turn it into the biggest gas field in Europe. And I think everybody should sit up and listen to that. That is a huge statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What all the science now shows us is that we already have far too great reserves of fossil fuels, uh, which will tip us beyond all the dangerous climate change limits and commit us to climate breakdown. Um, and what we need to do is to leave existing fossil fuel reserves in the ground. What fracking is doing is expanding existing fossil fuel reserves. It's saying, yeah, we're not content just with the planet frying reserves we already have ready to be extracted and burnt. No, no, we're going to increase those reserves by finding oil and gas in places where it was previously n not extractable before. They were kind of saying at the time that the anti-fracking lobby was aggressive and um, were professional activists and things like that. So, and the majority of the people I knew in this movement were grandmothers and mothers and fathers and grandfathers and parents. So to sort of combat that, we thought we would assume the identity of the Lancashire matriarch. We thought, so we decided to wear tabards and headscarves and carry feather dusters. One, to show that we weren't aggressive professional activists, that we were actually just parents who've invested so many years of love into our children and tried to raise them, you know, to believe in democracy, to respect the planet. Uh, and this was about to be all pulled away from us, so we decided to adopt this, um, the Lancashire Nana, you know, the sort of woman who puts on the pinny, rolls the sleeves up and gets the job done. We needed them to know that this shot across the bow was simply a shot across the bow, and if they proceed, so will we, and that we are many, many more of them than they are. Before activism, I had never spoken to media or you know, felt comfortable speaking to a crowd or anything, but you find your niche and you realise that um, in, in any movement, particularly in activism, I found that there are quiet voices. Oh, that are so wasted because sometimes the greatest knowledge comes from them. All power and all respect to those amazing people out there who have been fighting it since 2011 when, when the earthquakes happened in Blackpool. Because that's, that's a long time ago now. It's 2017 that I'm talking to you now, right? And it's them alone who, sh who should be proud of the fact that fracking hasn't happened properly since 2011 and that they've actually managed to stave off this, this absolute beer moth roller coaster ride of a gravy train, you know, a Ponzi scheme. There's huge amounts of money invested in this. Huge amounts of money invested in the PR and that revolving door and, you know, the revolving door between parliament and business. And, you know, there's so much invested in this. And yet it's, it's those plucky locals who have just stood up against it. With very low public support for fracking, many are asking why the government has allowed the industry to force a controversial process through. A collective of journalists and academics set up Spinwatch to investigate how the public relations industry can distort public debate. Politicians don't make decisions in isolation, in a vacuum. They are influenced by all sorts of other things, so whether that's what Parliament thinks or what the media thinks or what the wider public thinks. And so very often what lobbies have to do is they have to influence those other stakeholders. So they will set up a 
what we call third party groups. So that's something that's separate, seemingly separate from the industry, who will voice the messages of the industry and is entirely funded by the industry. So this goes all the way down to local communities. So they will they will target communities with different communications. So they will find what it is that motivates the local communities and they and you see them targeting schools and things like that. There's not one message that goes out to everybody. There are targeted focus messages getting all these stakeholders on board so that the minister can make that that decision. Um, it's always easier for lobbyists to operate in an environment where there is minimal public scrutiny because then the minister's got room to manoeuvre. Deals can be done. Um, the, the more public noise there is about it, then the harder the lobbyist job is. But they've worked out lots of tactics to, to get around that. I will never forget watching George with his shirt off for the TV cameras. There he was, shouting his head off, talking about shale gas companies producing filthy energy and getting filthy rich. <laughs> and of course, that's great. But today, I want a more simple message. If anyone thinks caring about people is what we are doing today, they are living in a fantasy land. I think there is a very cosy relationship between the fossil fuel companies and government ministers and I think that absolutely has to change. You know, I put some questions down uh, in the past about the number of representatives from fossil fuel companies who were not just lobbying government but were sitting inside Whitehall, inside what was then the Department for Energy and Climate Change, literally helping to draft policy themselves. That is frankly not right. Uh, we should not have that kind of relationship between these big companies and government. What we should have is an open, transparent, democratic process. And crucially, what we should have is what the government says it cares about, which is those local decisions. People locally here made their voices heard. The local council responded to that to say no to fracking. And it is quite wrong that those views have been trodden over in the way that they have by this government. In the belief that the government had breached their oath of office regarding fracking. One man set out to perform a citizen's arrest on the Prime Minister. The problem with trying to arrest a government minister is security. That the moment you get near them, they're going to jump on you so you can't explain your case. But you here today attempted to break a citizen's arrest. Yes. Not no, I'm not attempting. I would like you to do it. I would like you but to somehow we're not do that. register. But if you're not going to do that, I have to. Because it's. But you're not going to achieve that either. Government owes us all a duty of care. And in that duty of care, they have to be fair, impartial, and they have to be based in evidence, not ideology and supposition. And so, what I was seeking to prove that when it comes to something like fracking, they breach their duty of care to the public by being so stupid, by ignoring the evidence and by not responding as they should and they're required to do uh, to, to the complaints that they hadn't properly followed the available evidence. So I offered my evidence, they turned it down and then I refused to leave because I wanted to do the arrest myself. Um, I wouldn't let the executive cars in and out because I wanted to search them to see if there are any government, any cabinet ministers in there. And it took them four hours to get uh, annoyed enough to finally arrest me. Many years ago, I fell in with a, a lot of bad Quakers who taught me all about the law and how the law works. And if you go along, you get arrested, processed, prosecuted, fined. That's what the system loves because you're obedient. If you actually work in the system to make it fight itself so that the, the legal process is working for you, you know, it's opening up those avenues of exploration. You get disclosure of a court case, so they have to reveal documents, which otherwise they might not have wanted to do. That's how the law works. The law is there to protect everyone, but you have to know how to use it. And that, for me, is the best part of campaigning. It's using your rights in a creative way to make the system do something it perhaps doesn't normally want to do. And that is also how we hold government to account. While the rest of us get a chance to put our cross on a ballot paper once every five years, there's a smaller group of people who get to talk to government almost every day. And these are people with big money and big corporations behind them. And government listens to them partly because power is attracted to power 
and the way you gain power is by appeasing those who already possess power and corporations possess an awful lot of power, far too much power for a true democracy. But part of it is that those corporations are paying for the politicians to win elections. We have a political funding system in this country which um, allows people to give as much money as they want. And if you have a million pounds to give, you can give a million pounds. And with that million pounds, you can buy 100 million pounds worth of policy. You can buy a policy which says, oh, we're going to stop regulating your industry. We're going to allow your practice to go ahead. We're going to stop taxing you. And that can be worth 100 times what you've given to the politician. This isn't a democratic society which allows that. It's a plutocratic society where money rules. The one thing that lobbyists fear is the grassroots. Anywhere where you get people, ordinary people, gathering together and voicing clear demands and clear concerns, that is very problematic because that's something they can't control. And it's the same with social media. You hear lobbyists talk about the online space like, it's, like they're in some sort of Cold War scenario. I think it can all be attributed to the fact that you have ordinary people going down and saying, no, not here, not here, not actually anywhere, but not here. And for these very rational reasons. And yeah, effective grassroots campaigns um, are so, sort of a commercial lobbyist's worst, worst nightmare. In 2010, the government gave the chairman of Quadrilla free reign to appoint more than 50 people from the oil and gas industry into each government department. The connections between central cabinet at that time, you know, and, and, and major fracking companies is just, you know, it's incontrovertible, it's, uh, it's embarrassing. Um, but you also have a situation where Lord Brown, OK, so who's the guy who was running Quadrilla, who was the guy who was in charge of BP when Deepwater Horizon happened, and they went, no, don't worry about the health and safety. You know, they were cutting on that. 11 people died there. You know, aside from the horrific kind of um, environmental disaster, 11 people died on that disaster, right? And that was Lord Brown in charge of BP at the time. And the next thing we know, he's in charge of Quadrilla, and he's a um, me member of the Cabinet without portfolio. In other words, he's actually in the Cabinet without a role other than representing corporations. Paul Mobbs charted the links between the various fracking companies, energy corporations, academic institutions, and government departments. He titled it the Frackagram. The idea of the Frackagram is it's the relationship between government industry, the media, academia, but it's, it's not the people in there or the companies that mean it's the links between them that define so it's not knowing that david cameron um, is the prime minister it's that uh, lord brown who he appointed as a business minister is also the ceo of quadrilla and a manager um, at riverstone which is a big global energy investment house and so it's the relationships that define the issue not the people in July 2017, a UK-wide network of environmental activists agreed to support the fracking campaigners in Lancashire. As a network of people that are skilled in direct action, we wanted to come here, help shut the site down every day and really like build momentum of what's already been a, a six year long campaign by the local people and an incredible six months of direct action from protection camps and also from local people as well. Reclaim the Power are not professional protesters. Nobody is paid by Reclaim the Power to do anything. Reclaim the Power is a voluntary grassroots network. It's accessible, it aims to be complete, as accessible and inclusive as it possibly can. Anybody can rock up and come along and get involved in, with Reclaim the Power. Reclaim the power activists lock their arms inside homemade metal tubes filled with concrete and blockade entrances. Specialist police units have to spend hours carefully cutting the activists out. Police became so determined to stop the tactic that they even prevented a Sky News journalist from reporting about the lock-on devices. To stop Quadrilla's trucks, Reclaim the Power used many techniques to get their arm tubes to the fracking site entrance without alerting the police. 
zooming out from our fight here in Cracking in Lancashire. Different photos, we're going to send our message of solidarity across the world. So during that time, we uh, some people laid down, had arm tubes in their rucksacks. They deployed with a carabiner clip around their wrist, inside the tube, inside the rucksack, locked on. So what's the strategy? Why do we do this? Um, it takes a long time to get the cutting team in to go through the different kinds of like materials and cut you out and so it's a really good way of like blockading a site and stopping action from happening. The people of Lancashire have said no to fracking and that's really, really clear. The council has said no, the local people have said no, um, but the central government has overruled them. Um, so people feel that there's no choice now but to try and prevent this fracking operation from going ahead and to make it as economically costly as possible for Quadrilla to go ahead with, with fracking in Lancashire. We've pulled off an action every single working day and despite an almost fortress-like uh, atmosphere down at the gate, we've managed to roll out action after action after action after action that have been carried out by people from all over the country, all kinds of different walks of life coming together to support the local community here and their efforts. I think it made clear that we were serious. I think they thought we were playing before, you know. I think it shows that we were concerned, serious, we weren't going anywhere, and that we were going to keep on coming back with more. Come on, get out of the room, come on. Safety. The main goal was always to disrupt Quadrilla as much as possible. Um, this is about, you know, economically disrupting the fracking industry um, because they're, they're here without a social licence to be so. Like, the local people here said no to fracking, and the county council said no, and the government overturned that decision. And they've gone through all the different processes you're supposed to go to to make this thing not happen, and all that's been left is direct action. So as a network of people that are skilled in direct action, we wanted to come here, help shut the site down every day, and really, like, build momentum of what's already been a, a six year long campaign by the local people. We got three pairs locked on successfully, straight out of a van very effectively, got straight in and down. The security and the police are being very brutal with the next pair who are trying to lock on and it looks like some people have been hurt unnecessarily. Folks, we're not moving from where we are, okay? That's where people want to be. People are hurting themselves. Climate change is a, it's a massive problem and it's not something that can be ignored or denied. Um, so yeah. That's why we're here. This site here is ground zero. This is, this is the one where they're trying to start. And this is the one where we really want to try and stop them. Really stop them. So that investors and the like can see there's no money to be made out of this. We need to get out of this. We want to go into renewables. We're not going to win with this. This is the crux. This is the stepping off point from where this industry may or may not succeed for them. And there's a lot of money at stake. We tend to try and work with frontline communities throughout the country who are facing fossil fuel extraction, airport expansion, um, to try and uh, use our network, our skills, our creativity to take action with that community to stop the thing that they're, they're campaigning against in their local area. Um, we were already had a relationship with various campaigners up here in Lancashire, um, and the Nanas in particular, the, the Fractory Nanas, invited us um, in order to come bolster the local campaign that has already been fought by the locals here for six years. The rolling resistance is um, it's a new approach for reclaiming the power. The idea has been to cause quadrilla misery every day of the year so that they continue to make losses. They've made losses three years running. I've been involved in a lot of action support, so helping um, actions kind of take off. And lots of people, lots of people get involved at various levels, cooking, cleaning, sorting the site out, and also taking direct action. One of the most audacious things that uh, Reclaim the Power have done this month, and I was part of the crew trying to get that in um, in place once the security were distracted with the bus.
Using the bus as a shield, the women aimed to block the entrance, but had to settle for the road instead. One crew ran uh, behind the bus and one crew ran uh, straight off the bus, kind of towards the gate. And yeah, it was a complete success. Not everything went according to plan, however. And actually what ended up happening with that arm tube was the security guard um, pulled one of the girls out, he was about to be locked on, um, and decided to put his hand in the, in the lock-on device. Why? Yeah, why? I don't know, I was intrigued. Have you changed sides? I was just preventing another person putting their arm through here. Oh, so you're not a protester? I'm definitely not a protester. Obviously it wasn't ideal, but provided very comical um, for, for all of us to see a security guard locked on. So my arm is in the tube and then I've got a chain around my wrist with a little like thing to click on a kind of pole that's over there. The fracking site remains shut down for the entire morning, preventing the drilling equipment from entering. My mum has been coming down to Preston New Road, standing by the side of the road, bearing witness, holding her placard, and realising increasingly that that is not going to turn the tide and that more action is needed. I've been a teacher. I've run a, I've had a restaurant and uh, for the last however many years I've been a psychotherapist and I don't know, respectableness creeps up, <laughs> almost unnoticed and somehow it's very freeing to be, to have crossed this line and to be doing something that's moral, that's right. We had three large boxes. We actually had a box within a box that supported reinforced arm tubes that we were going to lock on into. We eventually managed still to get those boxes off the trailer and get all of the designated lockers on actually locked on into their tubes, which is a complete miracle. We were all in the family very, very sympathetic to this cause that we all thought fracking was the worst thing. We all cared deeply. We thought it would be ruinous, that it would ruin the country, ruin the landscape, ruin the water. We thought, oh, we could, we could do an action with three generations. It was me, there was my sons and my granddaughter. Was you expecting this today? Uh, we're always expecting some sort of action, yeah. John, after, yeah, all right. What I hope is, I suppose, that people will realise that for me to take these steps and make this journey and cross this line, it's because I see something so dangerous and so terrible. You see what the level of protest is here and it's not going to go away and every other site further down the line you're going to have locals rising up like we are. Yeah. I mean, I've never done anything like this in my life. No, me neither. You know, and it, it, you know, people like me who's never done anything like no. that are prepared to come here and stand up and speak out. I'm sure lots of other people I'm the same. Will. I've never done any protest like in my life until I started with this. It's the first time ever and it's been a revelation. The number one demonstrable impact on life of fracking in America is fatal road accidents. Because you have a 50 tonne lorry barreling down the road, local car, collision, local fatality. When do we hear that talked about? But in Britain especially, because our roads are smaller and it's busier, uh, when do we talk about junction loading and all the impacts that the extra traffic will have? As well as arm tubes, the activists also stopped the trucks by climbing onto them. The sometimes risky tactic became known as truck surfing. Activists managed to stop an entire convoy en route to the fracking site. I just got on the low trailer. I didn't really know what I was doing. I've never truck surfed before. I just got on the 
on the trailer carrying the, the load and somebody shouted, get up on the cab, get up on the cab. So I climbed up there um, and then realised why, because it's quite difficult to get me off. Um, and uh, thought maybe I, I could be up here for, you know, two or three hours until the police get me down. Um, ended up being up there for three and a half days. We said no! 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 You know, when you've got 100 hours of guys on a truck, you know that at every hour of the day, so I got up at like 4.15 in the morning because I thought, I know everyone's wondering, how are they? These people have been here holding these trucks in place and preventing them from coming to a fracking site. There's maybe no other live streamer that night, so you sneak out and you're whispering around and you're going, there they are, they're all all right. And lots of people who are invested in us, who care about how it all turns out and care about us, will sleep better knowing that they were all okay. So today, these vehicles, when they are, when your campaigners are... I spoke to the general manager of their fleet and explained the situation here, explained what those loads were, where they were going to, what they were being used for, and the impact that was going to have on the local community. And they were very sympathetic, and they categorically stated that had they known that's what it was and where it was going, they would have never taken it on in the first place. So. In the night, in the day, in the wet, in the sun, in the cold, in the wind, in all the elements, <laughs> you get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> they've stuck it out through all of it. And why have they stuck it out? They've stuck it out for the yeah. same reason that we're all here. Yeah. That we're all gathered here together. Yeah. The convoy was held up on the road for three days and nights, prompting the haulage company to release this statement. If we had known this delivery was for the company Quadrilla, and to be used in the questionable fracking industry, we quite simply would not have become involved. I think that changed the narrative maybe more than most things, because I think when people watched that, they were like, yeah, okay, maybe I could lock onto a tube for a while, maybe I could be on there 14 hours, maybe I could stay out of the gates, but could I stay on top of a truck for 100 hours? It's finally sort of made national media and made people, oh yeah, unaware of it, and, and that, I mean, although we use social media and that's really good, for some people, when it hits them in the face on national media, oh, that's the sit -up that thing. makes them sit up and take notice. And that's what it's achieved. This type of action is very effective um, because with a one arrestable person, um, you can stop a, a lorry containing all the parts, stop it from moving for what we've seen here for three, four days, or however long you want to be out there for. And so that's, and that's just with one person in a very safe environment. There's only one moment of action when you're climbing up there, and after that, you're, you can't afford to sit down and do what you want. Cheering us on, and that everyone who's been here since the whole process started. There's a sense of purpose being up there. You know you're, what, any, every minute you're up there, you're stopping that equipment from getting into sight. You've got, you immediately got that sense of being, that sense of purpose of being up there. And quite often, as with these lorry drivers, people don't realise that what they're carrying and where it's going and what that means to the local community. Um, and when they do, you can find you have like quite surprising support. So yeah, targeting parts of the supply chain, yeah, so it is an important part of the campaign. We can assure people that some of the concerns that you have regarding oil and gas drilling will not happen on, on our watch and, and will not happen with wells we drill in this area. Don't be taken in by the companies and what they say. They're very slick, they've got a lot of money and they'll try to convince you. So look beyond the hype. It's no good sitting on your backside and thinking it'll go away or whatever. So you've got to do something about it. You've got to stand up and fight. Concerns these fantastic campaigners from Lancashire, how could it be right that their voice is taken away by a government that's too close to the vested interests of big business and has rigged the law in their favour. How can that be right? It can't be right. So there will be no fracking in Rosica, no fracking in Preston New Road, no fracking in Kirby, Mispleton, and no fracking anywhere in the UK. If I can do this, you know, I'm prepared to do it, I'm sure that every person in the country is capable of doing it, doing something. You know, even if it, even if it just means emailing your MP and saying, you know, we don't want this here. 
so many, so many different reasons we should be investing in climate jobs, in good renewable energies and not in retrograde, stupid ideas like causing more pollution and more climate change. Fracking is actually disastrous for us uh, and the more that people get to know about it, the better it will be. You are not alone. I am with you. And there are millions of people throughout the country that support your struggle, that are with you, and we will defeat the fracking industry. Reclaim the Power taught local Lancashire Green Party councillors how to use the tactics of direct action. I'm a county councillor on Lancashire County Council and I've been involved in local government politics now for nearly two decades, but I've never done anything in terms of direct action like this before. But I feel as though I have to now because local politics and the local authority has been completely ignored by government. We've exhausted anything that the council can do to make our voice clear that we don't want fracking in Lancashire and that it's dangerous for local people, it's not good for future generations. So I feel as though I'm going to be here with local people putting our bodies on the line really because our voices haven't been heard. You won't be fracking long, wherever fracking's threatened, we'll sing our fracking song. And if you're fracking wankers, you can see there's something wrong. You think you're fracking clever, but you won't be fracking long. The Green Party is a very grassroots, decentralised party and we are incredibly proud of the actions of councillors like Gina Dowding who have taken peaceful, non-violent action because we recognise that that is a very necessary and legitimate tactic alongside a whole raft of other processes that people are engaged in. But you know what? When the democratic system has failed so manifestly, as it has done here, but local people tried to raise their concerns via their local council. The local council said no to fracking, and yet we've seen the government basically run a coach and horses through that decision, overturning local democracy. I think when that happens, then you can't be surprised that people look for other peaceful tactics to pursue as well. I do remember um, going to my first protest with my placard and how um, frightened I was, actually, because you, you stand there and think, oh, I'm stood here with this placard and I might get into trouble. And then eventually I ended up as part of a direct action. Although I'm a councillor, I am also still Julie Brickles. And it was Julie Brickles that decided direct action was needed. How are you feeling there? I feel all right. I was very careful as well not to block the road, not to impact my residents in that way. I feel the only people we impacted that day is Quadrilla. Lancashire Police spent three million pounds drafting in offices from all over the country to protect Quadrilla's site. Their use of force on people was often criticised by campaigners. That is somebody's hair that they've just pulled out. That is some lady's hair they've just ripped out of their head. Doing that. What you're doing is completely inexcusable. Yeah, just being made fools of. Puppets. A lot of you are decent people who are just being abused. You want to tell your bosses to stuff this job? The protests prompted the Shadow Chancellor, John Macdonald, to visit the site for himself and to promote the Labour Party's vision for energy production. We'll ensure we become world leaders in decarbonising our economy. And we'll do it partly through 
of publicly owned energy supply based upon alternative energy sources. Most of the people I've spoken to, the vast majority of them I've are local residents and this will be their first engagement with police in a situation like this and a lot of them expressing their shock. I'm worried about the scale of the policing operation, that's one issue, and the cost of that, obviously, but also I'm worried about some of the physical force that has been used. You know, I saw the video of a, a man in a wheelchair being pushed over. Police were also criticised for their overuse of force during the protests against Quadrilla's operations in Sussex. And you? Outside, outside, outside. I mean, I've met so many people who now fundamentally have no trust in the police. People who will not talk to the police, people who will think very hard about talking to the police if they were, they witnessed or experienced a crime. And that's down to the decisions that have been made by that operation, frankly. So I think many people start off campaigning and think, well, you know, we're engaged in in non-violent protest and you know we're simply trying to express our opinion and we have a right to protest and the police will have to respect that and then many people then have a, a rude awakening when they discover that, that isn't the case uh, that what the police despite constantly making noises about the fact that they are seeking to balance the rights of protesters and the rights of the industry fall down very heavily on the side of the industry again and again when people realise that to be effective in actually challenging the company they've actually got to they've got to engage in a blockade, they've got to potentially consider breaking the law, things change. Netpal train people how to observe and record useful information during the protests. Their notes can be later used to defend activists in court. They have a role to uh, arrest people who break the law. And many people who go along to the to protest have a an understanding that they may well be peacefully breaking the law um, and that there are potential consequences for that. The laws that they're breaking are very minor. So their role is to, is to police the situation as they find it. What their role isn't to do is to swamp the area with huge numbers of police, feel that they should engage in intensive levels of surveillance and trying to build up a picture of what those protest movements are. I mean, they're not just uh, intimidating. We think that many of them are designed to put people off. They're about disrupting some of the, some of the development of some of those protest movements. The situation with the police is, is beyond belief to me. What we're seeing from the police on a daily basis is frightening, it's heartbreaking. Disabled people are getting pushed about, women are being shoved around, you know, people are being actually injured by the police for no reason. It, it's terrifying. On a Wednesday, we wear white and we call for calm. And then we will stand in silence for 15 minutes in front of the police, just to try and diffuse the situation, but just to have a moment of sanity in the middle of all this insanity and maybe make them see the humanity in us. I do feel for them because they're being used. They're being used to do this to facilitate an industry that's going to harm them as well. So to stand in front of them silently um, is just to call for that calm, to see us, see who we are, see that we're mums. Yeah, we're probably old, most of us are old enough to be their mums. We just love our families and will do whatever it takes to protect them. I am absolutely certain that fracking can be stopped in the UK and it will be stopped and it will be stopped by actions like the people, brave people who are here at Preston New Road today because they really are in the forefront of the fight against climate change and I believe that they are changing both public opinion but also crucially political opinion. More and more MPs are looking with dread at the idea of having protests in their own constituencies. They don't want to see that. They are going to be listening more to local people in the future and that will be because of the actions of people like those who are here today. At some point, Quadrilla's got to break. Um, at some point, their investors are gonna, gonna lose patience. Um, and we, all we can do is just uh, facilitate the continuation of, 
of this. And if all those people who disagree with fracking, who are concerned about climate change, if we, if we rise up, we can change things, we can turn the tanker around. What I'm concerned about is that this is the first operation in terms of this area. Quadrilla, the company, clearly has plans for a large-scale development of this. That will, well, that will carbonise our economy for another generation. That can't be right when we've got the threat of climate change. The only way we're going to stop it, to me, is if enough people stand up and speak out because you've got huge players like Ineos, you know, these big companies waiting there in the wings, you know, waiting to dive in. If people don't stand up, they'll just come in and they'll just sweep us all out of the way as if we don't count. I think we absolutely face more obstacles because we have a government whose face is set against us as an industry, uh, whereas in terms of fracking, the government just couldn't do more to make it happen. I think they will fail though, ultimately. Fracking won't happen, uh, it certainly won't happen at scale, and renewable energy will win. You know, it's a tide that's irresistible around the world, not just in Britain, so it's just a matter of time. Resigning officer, taking all of this into account, and balancing the interests of the environment, our economy, public health and public opinion, I can confirm that the conclusion of the Scottish Government is that we will not support the development of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. It's been really amazing and really beautiful and the kind of relationships that you build with people here. There's so many different kinds of people and people that you would never normally spend time with necessarily and like you know if you met them in a pub and you were sat at the next stool you maybe wouldn't even have a conversation but here because you know everyone's fighting for the same thing the relationships you form are so strong and, and they're just going to last now and even though this month is over for us those relationships are going to last and that's what's going to bring people back knowing that together with all these people that we really love now we're going to help continue to stop this industry not just in Lancashire but around the UK. I picked Drill or Drop um, because in um, oil and gas licences there's often a drill or drop clause and it says to the industry you've either got to drill a well or you basically drop your licence. And so I thought well this can have a double meaning if you like, it, you can go ahead with drilling in the way that the government at the time wanted to do or we can drop the idea and we can look at something else and so I wanted to explore that um, clash of ideas between go ahead and drill and really go out for shale gas and shale oil or look at alternatives um, like renewables or um, other options. I think safety first, safety first. Um, I think we just pick them up, move, drag them away, drag them away, pass them like the Red Sea and just enter down the middle. <laughs> down here. Start with the old lady! Start with the old lady! Start with the old lady! Warn yourself up on the old lady! <laughs> Just easy.